tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Support for this episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. Hello, friends. I want to do something I don't normally do and ask, how are you doing? It's okay, you can tell me. What's going on this week? Does the approaching end of Halloween season got you down? Although we get another one in 365 days, it still seems so damn far away. And if you don't feel comfortable talking to me, luckily BetterHelp is there to help keep your mental health in check during the changing of the seasons. They specialize in a variety of problems, including anxiety, depression, stress, and anger, as well as a number of other conditions or feelings. BetterHelp isn't a crisis line, nor is it self-help. It's professional counseling done online that's so convenient, you can do it from the safety of your own home, freeing you from the mounting pressure to go sit in a musty waiting room. All it takes is a few moments for an online assessment in order to better match you with the licensed counselor best suited to your needs. In most cases, a professional BetterHelp consultant will contact you within 24 to 48 hours of signing up. And that's pretty neat. So stop dreading the calendar. Sit down and check it out. I want you to start living a happier life today and enjoy what's left of Halloween. As a bonus, Horror Hill listeners will get 10% off of their first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash horror hill. Again, that's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash H-O-R-R-O-R-H-I-L-L. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 5. My name's Otis Jiley, host of Scary Stories Told in the Dark, now in its ninth season, and I'm stepping in for Jason Hill. And it's my pleasure to bring you three Halloween tales this evening. We're taking a trip down memory lane for this episode to some of Jason's earlier tales, just for your enjoyment. I hope you have a frighteningly fun Halloween this weekend with your ghosts and goblins, and be sure to have them bathed and settled before they turn into bats at midnight. Wait, they don't turn into bats? I guess that's just me, then. You're listening to the standard edition of this program, if you'd like to show your support, and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, 
visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. So until next week, I have three stories for you. Our first one is coming right up. And now, without further ado, from authors Blair Daniels and Craig Groshek, I give you The Haunting of Room 812. It was the most haunted room in all of South Dakota. Haunted by the lady in white, a bride who is left at the altar and jumped from the window to her death. Or, if you ask some, a woman who was brutally murdered by her husband-to-be. Are you picking up anything? Darren asked, staring at his K2 meter. Nope, I replied. No activity so far. How about you? Darren turned to Annabelle, the red-headed woman holding the camcorder. No, she said, looking at the screen. Nothing. Let's go in then, see if we get anything. I pulled out my keycard and shoved it into the door. The lock clicked, and I pushed the door open. The room was dark and cold. My hand skimmed the wall searching for a light switch. Even as a ghost hunter, I didn't like walking into totally dark, strange rooms. The lights flicked on, and we found ourselves in what appeared to be a normal room. Perfectly made bed, small windows, cream-colored walls. We all stared at our meters and cameras for a good hour. Unfortunately, not so much as a glowing speck of dust made its appearance. Darren was the first to give up. He groaned in disappointment and flopped onto the bed. Man, we're not catching any breaks here, are we? Nope. And I was sure we'd catch something, I grumbled. This stinks. My thoughts weren't on spooky ghosts, but our dwindling YouTube ad revenue. Every ghost hunting video we posted garnered fewer views. We needed this. One blurry silhouette... One bout of flickering lights. One chair moving on its own accord. Something. Maybe it's time we hire a video editor, Darren said, staring blankly at the meter. I mean, all the other channels do it. A little blur, some glowing orbs. No! Our whole thing is that our videos are real. We do not Photoshop. We don't edit. We post real stuff only. I crossed my arms and glared at him. You want to sell out? Resort to forgeries? I want to be able to pay my rent, he said into the pillow, and eat something other than ramen. Guys, shh. Annabelle brought a finger to her lips. The tinny ding of the elevator pierced the silence, followed by heavy footfalls outside. Someone's coming off the elevator, Darren said. What's the big deal? It's 1 a.m., Annabelle whispered. Who'd be up this late on a Tuesday night? The three of us swarmed the peephole. From what I could see, the elevator doors were open, and I heard faint footsteps. But no one was there. Probably just some guy going down to get a snack, Darren said. Looks like this place really is just a tourist trap, I said spinning the hotel pen between my fingers, just like most haunted places are. The night's not over yet, boys, Annabelle said, but her tone wasn't very convincing. We returned to our stations around the room. Annabelle set up her camera on a tripod and remained filming, but pulled out a tabloid magazine and turned her attention to that instead. Darren played games on his phone. I collapsed on the bed and stared at the ceiling. The hours ticked by. Around 3 a.m., Annabelle caught a glowing orb on film, but upon closer inspection, we realized it was just a mosquito flying near the lens. 
They've gotten better footage in the Walmart parking lot, Darren complained. This blows. It was around 4 a.m. that things started to get interesting. At exactly 4.11, the familiar ding of the elevator sounded again, followed by the same heavy footsteps. Annabelle leapt up and pressed her eye against the peephole. Guys! Guys, come here! We crowded around. The elevator and the hallway were both empty. The footsteps, however, sounded like they were inches from our door. She flung the door open. We walked out, cameras out and recording. As soon as we did, the footsteps ceased. But strangely, the elevator doors remained open. Annabelle ran inside and motioned for us to follow. Keep recording, she said breathlessly. I feel like there's something... here! My gaze fell on the elevator buttons. The buttons for the third, fifth, and seventh floors suddenly lit up at once, without being pressed. Did you see that? I cried. Darren and Annabelle nodded. A haunted elevator, huh? Well, that wasn't in our research. Of course not, Annabelle said, as the elevator slid to a halt at the seventh floor. The doors opened with a whoosh, and the empty hallway presented itself. The Alex Johnson Hotel wants tourists to get creeped out and buy their spooky little ghost package. They don't want tourists to hurt themselves communing with actual spirits. Her eyes met mine. Or worse. Why is it only stopping at odd-numbered floors? The third floor is where Alex Johnson lived, but... But why the fifth? Why the seventh... Annabelle shook her head. I have no idea. Or this whole elevator business is the result of a technical malfunction and the floors are chosen at random. Will you shut up, Darren? Annabelle said, rolling her eyes. The elevator is haunted. I can feel it. We came to a stop at the fifth floor. The doors parted, revealing an empty hallway that looked exactly like the hallway on the seventh and eighth floors. Then... They quietly slid shut, and the elevator descended. This time, it seemed to go twice as fast as before. I gripped the bar, steadying myself. Another high-pitched ding signaled our arrival, and the door slid open. What the hell? The third floor was dark. Not completely, I'll admit. There was a dim light coming from somewhere but it was much darker than any other floor we'd stopped on. I could barely make out the beige carpeting, the cream walls, the door extending into the distance. Holy crap, Darren said in disbelief. Are you getting this? I peered at my camera's viewfinder. In it, the floor was fully lit and identical to every other floor we'd stopped on. No, 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 that's, that's impossible, I said, my mouth growing dry. I, oh, there's something wrong. It looks normal on screen. I looked back up, nearly had a heart attack. A figure stood, barely visible, at the end of the hallway. Its head canted to the side as if out of curiosity. It was unsettling how perfectly it blended into the shadows. There. There. There's someone out there. I whispered hoarsely. Instinctively, my hand reached for the closed doors button on the elevator. The doors did not close. The elevator didn't respond at all. The specter continued to stare at us, its head cocked at an unnatural angle. It was too dark to make out anything else about them. Their hair, their clothes, their gender. It was all impossible to tell. I only knew one thing. They were getting closer. I reached for the elevator button. My finger touched the plastic. And then, I flew forward. 
I crashed hard into the carpet, the air rushing from my lungs. I sucked in a choking breath and tried to regain my composure. The elevator doors were closing, and in the quickly narrowing gap, I saw Annabelle and Darren's faces, staring back at me with an odd combination of horror and satisfaction. Wait! I screamed, frantically clambering to my feet. It was too late. My hands fell on closed doors. I pounded my fists against them. They didn't budge. I was trapped. I whipped around, my heart pounding. The wraith was gone. Okay, I reasoned aloud. Just call back the elevator and everything will be fine. I turned back to the elevator. The call button was gone. Where it had once been a blank wall surrounded the doors. What the hell is going on? I shouted. My only option was to make my way back to our room the old-fashioned way. The stairs. With a nervous gulp, I traversed the dimly lit hallway, half expecting the closed doors flanking me on either side to burst open at any moment. An odd, static buzzing came from behind some of them, like the sound of thousands of flies struggling against their restraints. As I passed one of the doors, I heard the muffled voice of a man. Maybe he knew where I could find a working elevator. I wasn't looking forward to walking up five flights of stairs. I've been trying, I overheard them say. I've been trying to leave for three days and I... I... I raised my fist and knocked. As soon as I did, the voice abruptly cut off. I waited, staring at the door. That's when I noticed the numbers hanging on his door. 308. We're upside down. The door cracked open, revealing the sliver of a wild eye glaring back at me. It was that of an old man, from what I could tell. The deep wrinkles of his face were bathed in shadow, making it look as if he'd been carved from wood. You're not one of them, he growled, as if it were some sort of shocking revelation. Um, no, listen, I came down the elevator, but there doesn't seem to be a call button down here. Do you know if there's another elevator? I glanced around at the dark hallway. And why are the lights so dim on this floor? He stared at me for a moment. Get out, he rasped. Get out before it's too late. What? Find a door, a window, anything, and get out. The door slammed in my face. Confused and slightly disturbed, I continued down the hallway. The lights dimmed nearly to the point of extinguishing, flickering softly in their glass bulbs. Over and over I lost my bearings, unable to determine which direction I was going. For what felt like an eternity, I felt my way along the walls, desperately trying to find my way until finally I arrived at the stairs. Then... I began that long, hard climb to the eighth floor. With every step, the man's words echoed in my mind. Get out. Get out. What did he mean by that? And the figure in the hallway. I had been ghost hunting for five years and I'd never seen something like that. Standard fare, including glowing orbs, odd tapping sounds, shadowy figures in the corner of my eye things that could technically be explained away by logic. This could not. By the time I got to the top, I was panting and sweat clung to my shirt. I pulled the door open with a groan and walked down the hallway. The hallway was dark, just like the third floor. It must be some sort of hotel-wide power problem, I told myself. That actually made me feel better. Maybe everything that happened, the elevator buttons, the dim lights, was due to an electrical issue. It was an old hotel, after all. Maybe. In all the confusion, I'd imagined the shadows. 
and the old man was just some lunatic. I walked down the hallway, my shoes thumping conspicuously against the carpet. The silence was ominous, though not unexpected. After all, I reasoned everyone was sleeping at this hour. I arrived at room 812 and inserted my keycard into the door. The lock clicked, and I pushed the door open. The room was pitch black, even though I was sure we kept every light on when we left. Annabelle! I called. Darren? You here? We need to talk. Silence. I walked down the short hallway into the main room and froze in my tracks. Frigid air rushed in through the open window. On the windowsill, surrounded by billowing curtains, there stood a feminine figure facing away from me, wearing a white wedding dress. Hey! I called out to her. What are you doing in a room? The words barely out of my mouth when she pitched forward. I heard the soft rustle of fabric and the whistling wind as she plummeted towards the ground. Then, with a sickening crack of flesh against pavement, everything went still. Nausea washed over me. I fought the urge to vomit. I pulled out my phone and dialed Annabelle. My fingers nervously slipping over the screen and was met with a busy signal. Same for Darren. And for the police. Each and every time, I failed to get through. Then, my eyes fell on the hotel phone. I ran over to it and dialed zero for the front desk. It rang. A moment later, a man's voice answered. Hello? It all came rushing out. Oh, thank God. Listen, I need your help. I, I, just, I just, just saw this, this woman, and she jumped, and I can't find my friends, and... Come to the front desk. He responded in a slow draw. Then the line went dead. I stared into the abyss of the desolate room. Then, I got up, averted my gaze from the window, and walked back down all eight flights of stairs. When I finally wandered into the lobby, I found it deserted. The only faces I encountered were decorative and inanimate. The Alex Johnson Hotel had no less than six faces, wearing feathered headdresses carved into the beams of the hotel. When I looked up, I could swear I saw a flash of darkness in the balcony overhead. In an instant, however, it was gone. I ran toward the front desk. Is anyone here? I shouted. Hello, a voice called out of the darkness. A man bustled out of the back, portly and middle-aged with a carefully curled mustache and a pair of round glasses. What may I help you with? He asked, lips curling into a smile. I just got called from upstairs as someone just jumped out from the eighth floor window. Not to worry he said, cutting me off, his eyes locked on mine. She does that every night. I'm, I'm sorry, but... What? I responded incredulously. Oh, my dear boy, if you haven't noticed, you're not in South Dakota anymore. I looked around. That's ridiculous. Of course I am. This is the Alex Johnson Hotel. What are you talking about? Oh, it certainly looks like the Alex Johnson Hotel, doesn't it? He said, casting an adoring glance at the ceiling. Ah, yes. The attention to detail is remarkable. We have Agnetha to thank for that. Lovely woman, really. Have you met her yet? Listen... You tell me what the hell is going on right now. I just saw a woman jump from an eight-story window, and this this crazy guy on the third floor told me to get out, and when I try to call my friends, I get a busy signal. Of course, my boy. 
If it'll make you feel better, allow me to explain. He leaned over the front desk, his mouth stretching into a smile. It was only then that I realized there was something wrong with his face. His eyes protruded too far from their sockets, and his lips were so thin they were barely visible. The lift that brought you here, he said, gesturing to the elevator, travels beyond the veil. Are you saying I'm... I'm dead? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, not exactly, but... If you don't find your way back soon, you'll find escape quite impossible. And you may as well be. How do I get back? I need to get to Annabelle and Darren. He cut me off with a peal of laughter. Shivers crept down my spine. <laughs> Why so much concern for them? They're my business partners, my friends, my... My... The words caught in my throat. My teammates. Are you certain of that? I nodded. They lied to you. I balked. What would you know? I've never met you before in my life. Besides, you're just a, a front desk clerk. On the contrary, my boy, I know many things. His eyes twinkled and he leaned forward. A musty, rotten smell came off him and I cringed. When you were ten years old, for example, you stole a pack of gum from a shop on 4th Avenue. When you were eighteen, you were heartbroken when you walked in on your girlfriend. How do you know about that? I demanded. I have my ways, Kyle, and I'm certain you weren't pulled from the lift by some supernatural force. His bulbous eyes stared me down. His lips curled into an insidious smile. You were pushed. My mind raced. I tried to think back to exactly what had happened when I fell onto the third floor. I couldn't recall. One minute I'd been standing in the elevator. The next, I'd been thrown to the ground. It's the human condition, you know. Greed. What did your companion stand to gain by pushing you? Control of the business? Under new management, ooh, they can run things however they see fit. Rage burned within me. I didn't want to believe it, but I knew. I knew he was right. How do I get back? The clerk grinned rapturously, revealing rows of yellow teeth. Oh, I'm afraid it's too late for that now. I turned around. Dark silhouettes filled the lobby, just like the ones I'd seen on the third floor. Their crimson eyes flashed as they stepped toward me. It's been a while since we've had a newcomer, the man behind the desk said, practically salivating in his excitement. At that moment, Against all odds, above the fear and terror, an unexpected courage surged within me. It's me against this world, I realized. I wasn't going to go out like a coward. Not now, not ever. I watched the shapes swirl and advance in my direction. Across the dust-covered floors and faded carpet they came, the very formulation of the hotel quaking beneath their feet. Meanwhile, shadows coalesced on the balconies overhead, watching hungrily. I was completely surrounded. I sprinted to the stairwell. The shadows pursued me with superhuman speed, spiraling around the staircase. In an effort to lose them, I exited on the third floor and dashed towards the elevator, hoping to reach it before they realized I was no longer on the stairs. But to no avail. The ominous static sound returned. As I ran down the hall, each door I passed swung open with an ear-splitting creak, and the buzzing intensified. Innumerable shadows emerged on both sides, blotting out what little light was available. Their red eyes flared in the darkness. I came to a halt at the end of the hallway. 
The shadows swarmed and quickened their pace. Once again, there was no call button on the elevator, but I didn't care. I wedged my fingers between the doors and pushed them with all my might. With a grunt, I forced them open and squeezed into the elevator. As the cacophonous wail of the wraiths reached their crescendo, I pressed the button for the eighth floor. With a shriek, the doors came to a close. Mere moments before a horde of outstretched arms arrived. With a shudder and a groan, the elevator reluctantly ascended. With each second, the din of the screaming specters lessened. Until, at last, they were little more than a gust of wind in the distance. I took a deep breath and did my best to calm down. My relief was short-lived. A moment later, the floor shook beneath my feet. I grabbed the railings as my heart skipped a beat and threatened to evacuate my body. The lights began to flicker. The buttons flashed in a strange syncopated rhythm. And then, the elevator stopped completely. Dread settled in the pit of my stomach. I'm going to be stuck here. Forever. I ran to the doors and pounded on them as the lights oscillated madly. Let me out! I screamed. Let me out! Hissing whispers filled the elevator. At first they were scattered and unintelligible. But then, they snapped together, forming one voice. Exchange. They said in unison, We require an exchange. Whatever you want, I screamed. Anything but me, just name it. Two. The voices hissed through the static. We demand two in your stead. Yes, 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 fine. Just, just please let me go. The elevator trembled, and then it plummeted. I screamed the whole way down, but I didn't stop until the elevator made impact and the crushing pain consumed me and everything went black. My eyes fluttered open. I was lying on something soft. Up above me, light shone from an outdated fixture on the ceiling. Where am I? I wondered. I sat up and glanced around. The hallway, the armchair, the bed. I was back in room 812, and across the room, looking out the window, were Annabelle and Darren. Hatred burned within me at the sight of them. This must have been the last thing the lady in white saw before she jumped, Annabelle was saying, holding her camcorder. The window was open, and a cool breeze blew inside. They were oblivious to my presence. Or, she was pushed, Darren corrected her. Silently, I rose from the bed and approached the window. The spirits had abandoned an exchange. Two in my place. The choice was clear. Darren and Annabelle would not get away with what they'd done. They'd get what they deserved. Smiling ear to ear, I made my approach. Distracted as they were, my former friends never saw or heard me coming. Without hesitation, I shoved both of them out the window. Their screams echoed for a second or two before the unforgiving pavement put an end to that. With a smirk, I considered the irony of the situation. Darren and Annabelle would finally get proof of the afterlife. Just... Not in the way they expected. I walked back over to the bed and picked up the hotel phone, dialing the front desk. Hello? I said, in the most convincing panicked tone I could muster. My my, my friends, they just just had a terrible accident. They were leading out the window, filming, and and they lost their balance, and oh, oh, oh my god. I faked choking sobs. I think, I think they're dead. Oh my god, they're dead. I hung up the phone. 
The wintry air swept across my face as I imagined the whereabouts of the two who had tried to take everything from me. I grinned. If room 812 wasn't haunted before, it certainly was now. Support for this episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. So, like I was saying, the red X's on my calendar are inching ever closer to my favorite holiday, leaving me feeling depressed before it even begins. I mean, sure, we get the candy sales November 1st through the 3rd, but then what? Please tell me, I desperately need to know. Thanksgiving? No. I can't show up to family dinner with a faux axe through my head covered in crimson corn syrup. And believe me, I've tried it. It, uh, it didn't go over so well. And then the next year, everyone got miraculously sick and canceled, yada, yada, yada. You get my point. However, it's not all bad, because BetterHelp is there to remind you that Halloween isn't just a season or day of the year. It's a state of mind. Communication has never been easier and better. BetterHelp isn't a crisis line, nor is it self-help. It's professional counseling done online that is so convenient that you can do it from the safety of your own home. And hell, that means you can attend your visits in your Halloween costume all year round if you want to. Their licensed professionals specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, anger, family conflicts, self-esteem, and a number of other personal difficulties. All it takes is a few minutes of time for an online assessment, in which your results are used to best match you with the licensed counselor best suited to your needs. What's even better is, in most cases, a professional BetterHelp consultant will contact you within 48 hours of signing up. And you can't get those kinds of results calling a traditional doctor's office these days. That's for sure. Also, did I mention that it's also more affordable than traditional offline counseling, with financial aid being available? Leaving more money for your holiday shopping. Oh, God. They've gotten to me, too. I'm sorry, I've got to go. I have to go online and find my counselor. Speaking of counselors, stop suffering in silence. Get on there and give yourself the best gift you can give by checking out a better way to positive mental health. I want you to start living a happier life today. As an added incentive, Horror Hill listeners will get 10% off of their first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash horror hill. Again, that's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash H-O-R-R-O-R-H-I-L-L. -R 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 Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. You've been listening to The Haunting of Room 812 by authors Blair Daniels and our very own network creator, Mr. Craig Grosher. Our second tale of the evening comes to us from author Pete Zelizniuk. Now I give you The Candyman. The Candyman can, cause he mixes it with love and makes the world taste good. Willy Wonka. Every town has its ghost stories. Maybe it's the haunted house on the other side of the railroad tracks, or the spirit that haunts the tunnel in the woods. But people love talking about things that go bump in the night, and the places that they lurk. My favorite, though, have always been stories based in truth, and I don't mean the true stories 
your friends tell you happened to a cousin of theirs or the ones your drunk uncle tells you around the campfire. I'm talking about real stories. The ones you can verify through newspaper articles, police reports, and from people who were actually there. Maybe it's the academic in me, but I've always thought that those are the scariest. Those are the ones that become legend. Ever since I was a little boy, I knew that I wanted to be in one of those stories. Actually, it might be more accurate to say that I always wanted to be the story. After the things I've done tonight, people will be saying my name for years to come. Tonight, on Halloween night, I will become immortal. Before I get to the good parts, it might be useful to talk a little bit about myself. The real me, as they say. When this is all over and I am long dead, I know the real me will get lost in the story. The human I am will be replaced by a monster. A monster that people will remember. It's not all bad and not completely unexpected, but still... I'd like to be remembered at least somewhat accurately. Maybe this is why I'm doing this. I'm not sure, but I'll get to that later. I am a chemist by trade. It's not always an exciting job, but it paid me well enough to afford a comfortable life and interested me enough to avoid becoming a zombie. I like to make art, though I wouldn't call myself an artist. I do a little bit of everything, I guess. I paint... Do some sketches, some drawings. A couple of people told me I was pretty good. But I was never confident enough to make a real go at it. I have no wife or children. And I've never been married. I've had girlfriends from time to time, but things just didn't work out. It's not that big a deal. I can afford sex whenever I want it, and I don't have to worry about other people moving my things around. It wasn't bad to have a woman's touch around my house, but it always ends with them wanting to change things or throw my stuff away, and I don't like change. I like predictability. I like organization. I like science. I consider chemistry the purest of the sciences for a couple of reasons. It's a perfect marriage of mathematical abstraction and real-world practicality. It is... By its very nature, proactive. Sure, there's an element of discovery and reverse engineering, but I've been more interested in how to make shit happen. If I mix a little bit of this and add a little of that, then we get this. Every time. If I want a different effect, I simply substitute this for that, alter the conditions a little bit and a pinch of whatever, and voila, we get this. This part is important, actually. Not everything I mentioned is, I guess, but this is my story, and I get to say whatever I want. Now let's go back to Halloween for a minute. Some of the reasons I love it so much are likely obvious at this point, but maybe some others are not. I like dressing up in costumes, and though I'm not a huge fan of being around large groups of people, I love seeing others in costume as well. People can get really creative when they're not at each other's throats, and some of the women are really hot. Some people complain about how lots of women don't dress up so much as a character, but rather a sexy... whatever, be it a cat, a nurse, a witch, always a, a sexy that. Doesn't bother me. I think it's great. A bigger reason I like Halloween is the feel of it. I've always been a Northeasterner, so the crispness of fall and the changing of the leaves play a role in it. The air smells different. People start having campfire gatherings and telling scary stories, and I love the idea of that. One night out of the gear, the veil between our world and the ones beyond becomes so thin. Things can come and go. The mystery... The unknown. The anticipation. What's not to love? Trick-or-treating, 
While it used to be my favorite part of Halloween is now only the most important part to me. You've probably guessed it by now, but that's the brush I use to make my life's masterpiece. The children who came to my house and took my treats will be the paint. Halloween will be my canvas. This all sounds new, as if it's something I'm just enacting now. In actuality, I've been planning for this day for a very, very long time. In a practical sense, I started three years ago when I lived in Newburyport, Massachusetts. I started small. At first, I simply injected a concentrated dose of magnesium hydroxide into Tootsie Rolls. For those out there who aren't chemists, this is the active ingredient in milk of magnesia. It is a laxative. And boy, oh boy, it's a powerful one. I've used it before for pranks and the like, but this was definitely on a larger scale. Huh. The mental image of an entire neighborhood full of kids and parents shitting themselves up and down and sideways. It still makes me laugh my ass off. All in all, it was a pretty safe star. Things like this basically present as a stomach bug, and it would be a very strange thing for a doctor to test for it. Eat some crackers. Drink some ginger ale. Just wait for the waterworks to stop. Last year, I went a lot further. I was nervous, but if I ever was going to make the big leap, I knew I'd have to push the envelope. I could just tell you the what here, but I really want to tell you the how. I'm especially proud of it, and I want it to be a part of my legend, even if it didn't go exactly to plan. The main ingredient, and the hardest to obtain, was codeine. I bought tablets from co-workers, underwent some unnecessary dental procedures, had an accidental fall or two, and before I knew it I had a respectable supply. Next, I needed some iodine and red phosphorus, both easily obtainable without drawing suspicion. I picked up some paint thinner from the local hardware shop some gas from the gas station, and managed to steal some hydrochloric acid from work. I'll spare you the full equation, but if you've seen Breaking Bad, you have an idea of what the process was like. The end result was a very light, super concentrated, and very foul-smelling powder. It was my take on a fringe designer drug I heard about on the internet one time, a semi-synthetic opioid called Crocodile. I knew that it was going to pack one hell of a punch, but how could I get people to eat it? After a lot of consideration, I settled on black licorice. The stuff is absolutely putrid, but the taste is overpowering, and somehow, people actually like it. Plus, the idea of a deadly black candy is just so fucking perfect I could die. I was confident that I could mask the smell long enough to get it to the subject's mouth, I just needed to get them to swallow. I added a trace of wax to the heated compound, added concentrated licorice extract, and cut the strips into small, bite-sized squares. YouTube helped me throw together a couple other contrasting flavors, lemon, lime, orange, cherry. I cut them into tiny squares too, threw them into wrapped little packages, and called it a day. I hoped the sweet, citrusy flavors would offset the black ones enough to do the trick. It turns out I was mostly correct. The hardest part of that year was trying to find ways to distribute the candy to various locations to avoid any easily identifiable central source. I'm not going to make it easier on anyone who reads this and let you know how I did it, but I'll tell you this for nothing. It was a monumental pain in the ass. My skills are in science, not logistics, and that Halloween was an hours-long demonstration of the fact. However, I was able to fudge it enough to relax a little and enjoy the evening. I sat up all night listening to the news and passing out real Halloween candy to the kids in my neighborhood. I decided to dress up like a spooky chef, which I still think is hilarious and I spent most of the night pacing around in nervous anticipation. 
News started trickling in around 10 p.m. It began to heat up throughout the night and peaked nicely the next afternoon. You can read about it in the New Very Poor News front page 11 to 18. The article is called The New Very Port Nightmare. Crocodile laced Halloween candy sends town into panic. Oh, it's a cool title, but for all in all, I consider it a total failure in every way but one. At least I wasn't caught. In the end, 13 people were sent to the hospital, varying in age from 6 to 17. In retrospect, the main problem was that I concentrated the powder too much, and the effects of eating the candy were pretty much instant. The subject would ingest it, start power vomiting immediately, thereby releasing the odor and deterring further consumption, and the intoxicating effects happened right after that. One kid got into serious condition once as the caustic nature of the compound nearly destroyed her esophagus completely. But, sadly, she survived. Other than that, there were a couple of skin lesions, three cases of skin deterioration and scarring, a bunch of people getting super high unexpectedly, and a big cloud of disappointment. It caused some panic and alarm, but it was definitely not what I envisioned. Needless to say, it pissed me off. Although I wasn't caught, I was considered a person of interest for a time. However, having no criminal record, no history of mental health problems, and rehearsing for just such a possibility all came in pretty handy. So, I never had to sweat too much. At this point, though, it was obvious that I had to leave town once the coast cleared. No legends are written about a man who made the kids and parents of Rupert A. Knock Middle School shit themselves or projectile vomit, but I couldn't achieve my dream here. I needed bigger, and now I had a taste for it. In a move that was just of throwing a dart at the eastern seaboard, I found myself in Baltimore, Maryland. Even though I am a scientist, I've always had a poet's weakness for symbols. Baltimore. Drugs. A city in decay. And Allan Poe? Oh, I don't know. I thought it was cool. His stories were always my favorite, and that's where he wrote most of them. Maybe this is where I was meant to write mine, too. This brings me to today. My magnum opus. My life's work. My masterpiece. Once I'd settled on the primary ingredient, the rest of the plan just fell right into place, almost like it was destined to happen. This time, the active ingredient was methylene dioxypyrovalerone. It's a cool word to say, a bear to spell, but more importantly, just so happens to be the active ingredient in what's commonly known as bath salts. Due to the limitless beauty of the internet, I was able to stockpile the stuff bit by bit throughout the year. Then, I purchased a shit ton of bite-sized pretzels melted down a mix of rich chocolate, dark fudge, a little bit of caramel, while saving some to drizzle on top, then put my artistic skills to use. The sweetness of the chocolate and the saltiness of the pretzels were more than enough to mask the bitter taste of the salts. I coated the pretzels in the chocolate mixture, drizzled them with caramel, and, when they solidified, packaged them in adorable little Halloween wrappers. It's funny, but I've actually gotten kind of good at this candy-making thing. Rachel Ray would be proud. So here we are. It's now 1.30 a.m., October 31st, 2019. My pretzel bags have been dispersed from my common, nondescript suburban house on my nondescript suburban street in boring old suburban Baltimore. I had a good number of trick-or-treaters, I'd say 60 or 70 at least. And now, I just wait. Oh, I can hardly sit still. My heart is pounding and I can't catch my breath. There's no chance I get out of this alive. I know what I'm going to have to do. I just don't know how to do it. I guess I hope writing this down would make me come up with something. I have some ideas, but I really can't fuck this up. <sighs> I'm so scared. Oh, it's way too late for second guessing. 
I know the first thing people are going to ask when this all comes out is why. Why would anyone do such a thing? I can't say that I know for sure. Science teaches you a lot of things. One of the main things it teaches you is the absolute insignificance of the human being. When you're able to glimpse the larger design of math and the sciences, the hidden codes of the cosmos, the little ant trails we walk are shown for what they are. Shakespeare called them brief candles, and that we all strut and fret our hours about the stage, then are heard from no more. I don't want to be lost to history. I want to be remembered. If one is remembered, they never truly die. This is as close to a reason as I can muster right now. I honestly can't think. Think of it. Once this comes out, it will be the panic of a lifetime. Parents everywhere will fear for their children, and trick-or-treating will take on the spirit it was meant to have in the beginning. There's been far too much treat. It was high time for a trick. I am confident that I've done an admirable job in that regard. I've said about all there is to say on the subject. I hope that those who read this will tell my story over a family campfire, or as an excuse to test your kid's candy after a nice trick-or-treating haul. For now, I'm going to tuck this letter away, drink until I can't see straight, and watch the local news. I do hope I make it long enough to see some action. So, in conclusion, I simply want to wish the reader a very scary Halloween, and to remind them to never, ever, take candy from a stranger, even one that you think you know. And so, goodbye. Postscript. Excerpts from The Baltimore Sun Halloween Massacre in Tarrytown, 11-1-2019. The city of Baltimore was rocked to its core this Halloween as a rash of drug-infused candy was discovered in the quiet suburb of Tarrytown. The candy, which appeared to be homemade, was distributed to trick-or-treaters, then ingested by several in the neighborhood. The effects were catastrophic. At the time of this writing... Reports are that there are at least seven dead, fifteen wounded, and that the numbers are still climbing. Forensic analysis shows that the drug in question is what's commonly known in the street as bath salts. Once ingested, the subject experiences such effects as paranoia, delusions, extreme agitation, and psychosis. The effects are similar in both children and adults, and led to a series of deadly incidents throughout the night. 12-year-old Sally Walker stabbed her 8-year-old brother Ethan Walker in the head 12 times, killing him instantly before attacking his infant sister. After lacerating the baby across the mouth with a steak knife, she proceeded to bite the child's nose and lips, eating chunks of flesh from her face. When her father Robert heard the commotion, he attempted to intervene. Sally turned and stabbed him in the stomach before he was finally able to subdue the child. The father is in critical condition, and the child is in custody at the local psychiatric facility. Later in the article, Damon Medbury, a ninth grader at Newburyport High School, was trick-or-treating with his friends when he inexplicably started scratching at the skin on his face. According to a witness, his scratching became more frantic and forceful as the child emitted shrieks of anger. By the time police arrived at the scene, the child's face was covered in blood, and one of his eyes was pulled free from the socket, dangling from the optic nerve. The boy remains in critical condition at Anna Jacques Hospital, and doctors are not confident that he will ever see again. Still later, Megan Ruiz, a single mother of three, was having a Halloween party in her room when, inexplicably... She grabbed young Dylan Martin, four, into the kitchen, pushing him into the oven with a batch of sugar cookies. Though attempts were made to subdue her, by the time the boy was released he had third-degree burns on nearly every part of his body. He was later pronounced dead at the hospital. 
This rash of tragic events has been traced to homemade Halloween candy, Police Chief Maynard Avery says. He urges citizens of Baltimore to avoid any and all sweets gathered on Halloween night. While he reports that not all candy in the city is tainted, but that the risks are simply too large to take a chance. We have a couple of leads in the case, Avery said as he left the podium, and we will catch the perpetrator if it's the last thing I do. Post postscript The Black Candy Killer Found, The Baltimore Sun, November 3rd, 2019. Police have reported that the perpetrator behind the Black Candy Massacre has been identified as Robert F. Bullock, a 43-year-old chemist from upstate New York. The subject was found dead by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Inside, officers reported a scene only imaginable in a horror movie. It was terrible, said Sergeant Maynard Avery of the Baltimore PD. In 30 years of service, I've never seen anything like it. Police discovered an elaborate chemistry lab, a warehouse, full of dangerous ingredients and even something more disturbing. Investigators say that the perpetrator was wearing an elaborately crafted, scary chef costume, and a note was placed beneath Bullock's bleeding head. When the police moved the body, they saw that the bloody sign read, Bon Appetit. While we were investigating the scene, we heard a strange ticking from under the floor, he said. Avery went on to say, I remember reading some story like this once and we thought we'd check around. Reports indicate that an old tin heart-shaped box was found beneath the floorboards. We are told that among the items inside were a bunch of newspaper clippings and a sort of manifesto seemingly written by Bullock himself. Apparently, this wasn't the first time he did something like this, Avery said. No information was given regarding the contents of the manifesto as officials stated they contained sensitive information regarding the incident, and possibly other incidents besides. When asked about what the citizens should expect in the next couple of days, Avery offered some advice. The best thing folks can do now, he says, is to look through your kids' candy before you let them eat it. I mean, really... Look at it. Smell it. It might be the only chance they got. You've been listening to The Candyman by author Pete Zelizniak. As the Halloween season wanes, so does our episode for the evening. Which brings us to our final tale. Without further ado, from authors Blair Daniels and Craig Groshek, I give you the Halloween mask. Ding! I jolted awake. My phone lit up on the nightstand. It showed one new notification. Motion detected at your doorstep. 3.17 a.m. My heart pounded as my fingers slipped across the screen. I clicked on the security camera video feed. A man stood on my doorstep. He stayed so still. I would have thought it was a photograph if not for the bugs fluttering by every few seconds. His body melted into the shadows around him. But his face shone brightly. Or not his face. A white mask. And it was covered in blood. He stared straight at the camera. Completely still. Mouth twisted in a grin. It all started when I ordered the Halloween mask. Alicia and I decided to host the neighborhood Halloween party this year. I shelled out hundreds of dollars on plastic skulls, purple streamers, even one of those candy bowls with the animatronic hand in the middle. We still need to decide what to dress up as, my wife said, as she neatly stacked the boxes in the corner. I was thinking maybe Morticia and Gomez? No, Ugh, that's cliche. Alicia rolled her eyes. So, 
What, if it's cliche? It's just a neighborhood party. It has to be perfect. Well, whatever it is, you better decide soon, because the party's next weekend. I scrolled through the costumes on HalloweenCostumes.com, looking for something terrifying. Something our neighbors would remember for years to come. Last year, the party was hosted by my rival neighbor, David Chandler. Mm, perfectly handsome BMW driving David. My very own Ned Flanders. One upping me on everything from lawn care to job promotions. Last year, he threw an incredible party, dressed as the clown. From it. He even jump scared half the guests at various points throughout the evening. People were still talking about how awesome it was. I had to do better. What about that? Alicia asked, pointing to a plain white mask. It looked similar to a Michael Myers mask. White plastic forming the shape of a man's face with cutouts for the eyes and mouth. You could make it your own. Add blood or stitches or something. True. I added it to my cart, and after scouring the web for some promo codes, I didn't have much money left after all I'd spent on decorations, found a sketchy-looking website with what appeared to be a legitimate HalloweenCostumes.com promo URL displayed, with the offer code worked into it. It read, HalloweenCostumes.com slash promo slash select your scare 20. Without thinking, I clicked it. As soon as I did so, I was redirected somewhere that was definitely not HalloweenCostumes.com. Damn it, I thought. I should have copied and pasted the link instead of clicking it directly. As I pondered how many viruses I'd just been infected with and before I could do anything else, a strange message popped up, taking up my entire screen. Code input successfully. Select your scare. One. Two. Or three. What the hell is this? I muttered. I tried to just click away from the dialog box, but it wouldn't disappear. Finally, against my better judgment, I clicked the first option just to make it go away. I was happy to see I was back on the official HalloweenCostumes.com site, with my items still in my shopping cart, and the promo code successfully applied. I can't believe it, I thought. It actually worked. With that important Halloween-related task checked off my list, but many things left to take care of, I went on with my day, and quickly forgot all about the strange pop-up and eagerly waited my new mask. A few days later, I got an email telling me the package had arrived. October 29th, two days before the party. But when I got home, I found an empty doorstep. You didn't see a package? I asked Alicia. Didn't you get the notification? She asked, pinning up purple and orange streamers. We were the victims of a porch pirate. She pulled out her phone and handed it to me. Check it out. We have one of those security cameras by the door, mostly to avoid Bob, a resident traveling salesman, who seems to be selling something new every week. Whenever motion is detected, it pings our phones. Today, I've been swamped at work, though, and hadn't had a chance to look at it. I pressed play. I saw our doorstep and the brown cardboard box sitting on the doorstep. Behind it, on the sidewalk, was a figure in black. I watched as the man approached. He walked up my sidewalk with confidence, as if he lived there. As soon as he got close, close enough for me to see his face, he tilted his pale head down. Then he stepped onto my porch and, face still hidden, grabbed the package. He walked back down the sidewalk and disappeared. Why would he steal a package of Halloween costumes? Because your costume was just so amazing, he wanted it for himself. Alicia joked as she lined up bags of candy. It wasn't amazing yet. It was just the mask. I walked over to the table and helped her set up the candy. So, we have two days, right? What else needs to be done? Well, we need to get new costumes, and I was thinking Morticia and Gomez. I sighed. Fine, we'll do it. I thought that would be the end of it. 
Some guy stole the package and that was it. We'd never see the mask again. I was sorely mistaken. As I sat at the table a few hours later, dumping candy into decorative bowls, a flash of motion caught my eye. I looked up and saw someone walking in our backyard at the edge of the woods. They were dressed entirely in black, walking along the perimeter of the forest, and the dusk light was hard to pick out any details about them, like their gender or their face. The only thing I could see was that they walked with slow, deliberate movements, and it looked like they were wearing a white mask. I heard Alicia's footsteps behind me and motioned her over. Alicia, look. There's someone in our backyard. What? Seriously? She joined me at the window. But by the time she did, the person had already disappeared into the forest. Huh. Well, I'm going up to bed, Alicia said. We can finish this tomorrow. I followed her up. Minutes after my head hit the pillow, I fell into a deep sleep until I woke up an hour later. I looked at the clock. 1.34 a.m. I pulled myself out of bed and trudged over to the bathroom, eyes blurred with sleep. The moonlight shone in from the window. I walked over to it, as if drawn by the light, and peered into the backyard below. I froze. At the edge of the backyard was a figure dressed in all black, wearing a white mask, facing our house, standing still as a statue. My heart pounded. I reached for my phone, then remembered it was still on the nightstand. I raced over and grabbed it, then looked back out the window. He was gone. The next day, in the flurry of getting ready for the party, I forgot about what I'd seen the night before. Around 6 p.m., I headed out to the party store to pick up some last-minute things. There, I received a text from Alicia. Well, that was odd in and of itself. I knew she had an important call with a client that evening. Confused, I opened the text. What it said made no sense. I'm glad you found your mask, but can you please stop? I'm on the phone with Evelyn. I quickly texted back. Stop what? She replied. Stop tapping on the window. It's super annoying. I stared at my phone, panic seeping in. Then my fingers raced across the keyboard as I typed. I'm not at home. I'm at the party store. She did not reply. I grabbed my stuff and ran out to the car, phone pressed against my ear. I breathed a sigh of relief when she answered. Ben, I told you I'm on the phone. Alicia! I'm not home. Whoever you're seeing out there isn't me. You need to call the police right now. Memories of the figure I'd seen the night before rushed back to me and I shuddered. But call the police! I yelled. When I arrived home, the police were already there. Red and blue lights flashing in the darkness of our driveway. Alicia stood in the driveway, giving her statement, somewhat begrudgingly. All I saw was someone in a black hoodie black pants and a white mask with fake blood all over it. They were over there at the office window. You didn't recognize anything about them? The tall, lanky officer asked. I thought it was my husband, but he was at the store, apparently. Look, I'm sure it's just some teenager from the neighborhood playing a mischief night prank. And if it is, she said, giving me a stern look as I walked over, I don't want to press charges. We were all young and dumb once. The officer laughed at that, an annoying, high-pitched laugh that grated my eardrums. We'll take a look around and follow up with you, Mrs. Breslaw, he said. Thank you. Alicia turned to me, arms crossed, lips pressed into a line. Great. You've just wasted 20 minutes of my time. Evelyn is so pissed that I got the call short. There was some creep tapping on your window. I shouted back. What? You wanted to just ignore it? Obviously just some teenager. I mean, come on. It's mischief night. I'm just happy it was that and not getting TP'd. Ugh, it takes forever to clean up. Okay, 
Fine. I hurried past her and set my supplies on the table. Then I set to work ripping open packs of plastic spiders and bats. They fell onto the table with a loud, gross plop. I'm going upstairs, Alicia said curtly, leaving me to prepare for the party on my own. Ding. Motion detected at your doorstep. 3.17 a.m. The notification came through on my phone loud and clear. I tapped on the video feed, half asleep. A man stood on my doorstep. He wore all black. Covering his face was the white mask I'd ordered, covered in something dark. I jumped out of bed. Alicia! I whispered, shaking her awake. Alicia, he's back! What? She murmured. The man in the mask, he's back! He's standing on our porch right now and... Is he TPing in the trees? No! Then let me sleep, she groaned, rolling over and throwing the covers over her head. I know lots of crazy things happen on Mischief Night, but this... This crossed a line. A big line. A man standing on my porch in the middle of the night, wearing the mask I'd ordered? Probably the same man who'd stolen the mask in the first place, right off my doorstep. Well, this was too far. I crept out of the room and peered down into the foyer. Through the glass insert in our door, I saw him. He stood under the porch light, blurred and distorted through the glass. But I could still make out the white mask, stained red with blood. Should I call the police? Alicia would be mad at me. Screw it, this was too far. My fingers slipped over the screen. There's a man standing on my porch in a mask, I said, my words coming out as a jumbled string of syllables. As soon as the call ended, the figure shifted. Then it receded, until all that remained was the empty porch. I clicked back to the security camera feed. It too showed nothing but the empty porch and the shadows of the front yard. A sharp knock on the door tore me from my thoughts. I looked down to see two figures distorted through the glass. Two figures wearing blue uniforms. I let the police in and explained everything. I even showed them the security footage. They searched the backyard, but they didn't find anyone. When they finally left, I retreated back into the bedroom. Alicia, thankfully, somehow slept through it all. I locked the door and dragged a dresser over it for good measure. Then, I collapsed into the bed. I didn't fall asleep until the sky brightened with dawn, and the birds began to sing. Aren't you excited for the party? I stared out the window like a soulless zombie. I'd slept all of three hours, and the fatigue felt like a train driving over me, again and again. But I couldn't nap. There was so much to do. Spider cupcakes and monster fingers to bake. Decorations to hang. Candy bowls to put out. Will you hang these streamers in the office? Alicia asked, handing me a tangled mess of black, orange, and purple. But no one will be going in there. She quirked an eyebrow at me. You told me you wanted this to be the best party ever. That you wanted every single room decorated. Just in case. Okay, okay. I said forcing myself out of the chair. I took the streamers from her and entered the office. There, on the desk, was the mask. Mouth twisted into a smile. Gaping holes for eyes, dark red splattered across the plastic. Alicia! I shouted. She rushed into the room. Where? Where did you get this mask? I stuttered, breathless. It was on our doorstep this morning. Relief flooded through me. He wasn't in the house. It was just on the doorstep. My entire body shook as I fell into the chair. Why don't you rest for a bit before the party starts? Alicia said, laying a hand on my shoulder. I'll call you down when everyone's here. I nodded. Alicia thought I was overreacting. Maybe she was right. 
Maybe I was letting a mischief night prank by some dumb teenager mess with my head. I lay down on the bed, ignoring the dings of my phone on the nightstand, and closed my eyes. It seemed like only seconds passed before Alicia was back in the room, asking me to come downstairs. Everyone's here, she said, and they want to see you. I followed her down the stairs and froze. Every single person in the room wore the mask. Black clothes with that white mask over their faces, covered in splatters of blood, gaping eye holes, a twisted mouth. I felt dizzy. The room pitched before me and I gripped the banister for balance. Ben, are you okay? I swayed, trying to steady myself. Why? Why are they all wearing that? They said you asked them to. What? You didn't? No, I said as the crowd blurred before me. They said you left the masks with a note saying they should wear them to the party. A lot of people canceled because of it. Families with kids, mostly. She turned to me. You really didn't do it? Why would I? Alicia shrugged. I, I don't know. You were uh, obsessed with this party from the beginning, and, and the mask, I, I th thought maybe... She trailed off. If you didn't put the masks in their mailboxes, who did? Him. The man who had been tapping on the window. The man who had been standing on our porch last night. The man who stole my mask. As my mind swirled with questions, who he was, why he do this, the memory popped into my head. The promo code and the select your scare message. Had I somehow chosen this? I stared into the crowd. Fifty masked faces stared back at me, all identical. Anyone could be him, or no one. Before I could think, a hand pulled me into the crowd. Ben, hey, how's it going? A familiar voice asked behind the mask. Eddie Huntley. The blonde-haired man that lived three houses down the street. <sighs> it's good, <laughs> I said, faking a smile. He continued to talk, but I only pretended I was listening. He looked across the crowd. All the masked faces were turned towards each other, bobbing and nodding in conversation. Except for one. One who was staring right at me. I broke away from the conversation. Hey, hey, hey! I shouted, pushing through the crowd. His gaping eyes stared back at mine, soulless and empty. I grabbed the mask and ripped it off, and stared into the face of Mary Chandler, the wife of my rich, luxury-loving neighbor. Ben, great party. Love the masks, she said in her elegant, soft voice. Really adds a creepy flavor to the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> thanks, I stuttered. Hey, have you seen David? It seems I've lost him. I shook my head. She continued staring into the crowd. Ding! My phone chimed. I slowly pulled it out of my pocket and looked at the screen. Motion detected at your doorstep. 8.32 p.m. I tapped on the camera feed. There he stood. David? Who else could it be? He was missing, and there was the masked man, standing on my porch. Heart pounding, I fought my way through the kitchen, through the family room, and over to the front door. Now the porch was empty. I opened the door and stared out into the night. But beyond the halo of light the porch created, everything was a murky mess of shadow. I shut the door. The lights flickered, and then they went out. The room plunged into darkness. Shouts and murmurs sounded across the party. Masked faces whirled about it in confusion. Turn the lights back on! A woman shouted angrily. Cell phone flashlights flicked on, twinkling among the crowd of shadows. Ding! 
Motion detected at your back door, 8.35 p.m. I stared at my phone in horror as I heard the back door creak open, followed by heavy footsteps. I ran through the family room and into the kitchen. The back door hung open, but he was gone, blended into the crowd. Stay calm, I told myself. Get the power back on, then you can deal with finding the culprit. My head pulsed with pain as I considered the two options. Either someone flipped the master breaker, or someone cut the power lines. I decided to check the master breaker first. Alicia, I said, fumbling my way in the darkness towards her. Thank goodness she wasn't wearing a mask like the rest of them. Keep everyone calm, okay? I'm going to check the breakers in the basement. Oh, okay, she said, biting her lip. You, th you think maybe the fog machine was drawing too much power? Uh, yeah. No need to get her worried. Using my cell phone as a flashlight, I stumbled to the basement door. I opened it. The stairs loomed before me, stretching into the pitch black shadow below. A shudder ran through me. Maybe it was just the fog machine, I muttered to myself, descending the steps one by one. We had a menagerie of Halloween decorations out on the lawn, and it was possible that they blew the fuse. Then why would the whole house be without power? I forced the question out of my head and continued down the stairs. I made my way to the breaker box, my footsteps clicking against the cement. The master breaker was flipped. Someone intentionally walked into the basement and flipped the switch. My heart pounded in my chest. My hand shook as I reached out and flipped the switch back. The lights flickered to life, including the light bulb above my head. For a second, silence. Then someone grabbed me roughly from behind. I whipped around, thrashing against strong arms. A white mask stared back at me, smeared with blood, gaping, empty eye sockets. I tore away and jumped back. My body collided with my workbench. My eyes scanned it. There. There was my hammer, lying on the wood. I grabbed it. The figure jumped forward. Laughter echoed from beneath the mask along with a voice. I got you this- I lifted the hammer and smashed it into his skull. The man immediately crumpled. He fell onto the floor, head smacking against the tile. I crouched over him. Then I reached over and pulled the mask off. It was David. Footsteps sounded behind me, then shouts, then screams. Call 911! Someone cried. But David was perfectly still. The police carried him out in a body bag. The guests were gone. The masks were strewn across the floor, the couch, every room of the house. A few were completely crushed, stepped on in the chaos. The back door still hung open, letting in gusts of cold October air. I didn't sleep a wink that night. The image of David's face burned into my mind. I'd heard his wife explain to the police in broken sobs that he'd been planning some sort of prank on me at the party. He hadn't visited the house or stalked Alicia. He'd only planned to scare the party. She didn't know what it was until the lights went out. He was innocent. I spent half the day sleeping, the other half drunk. When night rolled around, Alicia pulled me off the couch. Sit on the porch with me, she said. Why? It isn't good for you to be inside all day like this. I followed her out, beer in hand. We sat on the back porch facing the forest. Ben, you can't, um... You didn't mean to, she forced out, glancing in my direction. No, I didn't mean to. The funeral's in three days. Maybe we should go. 
She reached over and squeezed my hand. I don't know if I can face Mary, I said, stumbling over my words. Or any of them. I... My words caught in my throat. There, on the edge of the tree line, stood a familiar figure, dressed in all black, wearing a white mask, splattered with blood. I stood up. Alicia grabbed my hand, but I yanked it away. Get the hell off my property! I screamed. The figure didn't budge. Fueled by alcohol and anger, I leapt off the porch and strode across the backyard. Ben, please don't! Alicia called after me. Take off your fucking mask! I screamed, closing in on the figure. He still didn't move. A man is dead because of your fucking games! Alicia jogged after me, turning on her cell's flashlight. Ben, stop, please! But I didn't stop. I didn't stop until I was inches from his face, but I could smell his sordid breath in the air. Take off your fucking mask, I growled. I want to see who you are before I smash your stupid little head. He just stared at me with those gaping eye sockets, plastic mouth twisted into a smile. Oh, you don't believe me. You should. I killed someone last night, smashed his head right in. I'm a murderer now. You hear that? I leaned in, my face inches from his. I killed someone because of you! And I'll kill you too if you don't take that fucking mask off! He didn't move. Fine! I shouted, spittle flying from my mouth. I'll take it off myself then. I reached up, grabbed at his jawline. Hold. It didn't come off. I stumbled forward, grabbed harder, pulled harder. No, 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 no. I took a step back, my heart pounding. It wasn't a mask. I watched in horror as his mirthful grin contorted into an angry scowl. Run. Run! I screamed taking off across the grass. Alicia followed, screaming her lungs out. I whipped around to see the figure chasing us at full speed across the lawn. I ran as fast as I could. I didn't stop until I was inside the house, closing the door. That's when I realized. Alicia had stopped screaming. The backyard was empty. Both of them were gone without a trace. Except for Alicia's phone in the grass, the flashlight shined up towards the sky, shimmering and sparkling in the shadows. I haven't seen Alicia since that night. It's been a week. I didn't attend David's funeral, though I suppose I'm now in the same boat as Mary Chandler. Her husband is gone. So is my wife. The police suspect that I killed David on purpose. After all, our playful little rivalry was well known among the neighbors. They also believe I had something to do with Alicia's disappearance and to fill in a motive for me. Rumors are flying that Alicia and David were having an affair. I've been advised not to leave town, so as much as I would love to leave this all behind, I'm stuck here with my guilt with my past. I leave you with a warning. The masked man, whatever he is, is still out there. And so, I beg you, don't trust anyone who wears a mask, who hides their face behind a grotesque facade of plastic because it might not be a mask, after all. You've been listening to The Halloween Mask by authors Blair Daniels and Craig Groshek.
Tonight's episode featured three tales from the very talented authors Blair Daniels, Craig Groshek, and Pete Zelizniuk. And they were performed by Jason Hill. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts. And leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference, and it would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at Jason's audiobooks, available now on audible.com. Check out the link in the show notes for Jason's ever-growing library of audiobooks. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support the show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn about more of the network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by Otis Jiry and its featured tale performed by Jason Hill. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors, Original music provided by Philip Ojeda. Finalization by Craig Groshek and N.M. Brown. Artwork by the amazing Omega Black. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like to perform? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you've enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to make sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave a kind comment as well. Don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, and you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.